My name is Daisha Clay. I'm the audio librarian here at Classical 91.7. While I'm a real librarian, I have a deep, dark secret. I know very little about classical music. I grew up listening to rock. And I know something about jazz. But when it comes to classical... The thing is, I want to learn. And as it turns out, I work with people who know a lot about classical music. Every week on this show, one of my coworkers will give me a homework assignment, a piece of classical music they think I should know, and then we'll discuss it. Come learn with me in the classical classroom. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the classical classroom. I'm Daisha Clay, and today with me in the studio is an actual professor of music, Michael Webster of the Rice University Shepherd School of Music. He is a clarinetist, conductor, composer, arranger. He is formerly the principal clarinetist in the Rochester and San Francisco symphonies. He's also the artistic director of the Houston Youth Symphony, and we will be featuring all music by the Houston Youth Symphony in our show today. Michael, welcome to the program. Thanks. I'm happy to be here. So, And today we're going to be talking about Tchaikovsky's uh, Sixth Symphony, um, his final symphony, which uh, is called the Pathétique, or according to this old score I'm looking at, um, in England they call it the Suicide Symphony. And it says here that nine days after its first performance in Petrograd, he died of cholera on... In, in 1893. Hmm. Well, but this, this symphony does have a fascinating backstory and made all the more fascinating by the fact that Tchaikovsky wrote copious numbers of letters to his brother and his nephew. Mm-hmm. So we have an extreme amount of documentation of <laughs> what Tchaikovsky was going through while he wrote the piece. Really? But I, what I'd like to do is to start with the music okay. and save the backstory for later. Okay. Because this is some of the greatest music ever written by anybody. Okay. And I thought it would be fun for our audience to put themselves in uh, St. Petersburg mm-hmm. in 1893 and imagine that they are part of the educated Russian audience that is about to hear the world premiere of a new piece by the most famous composer in the world. And so we, the Russian audience, sit in our seats and we see on the program a four-movement work. Adagio Allegro Non Troppo is the first. Allegro Con Grazia is the second. The third is Allegro Molto Vivace. And the fourth is Adagio Lamentoso. And the first thing we will look at is, oh my goodness, the fourth movement is an Adagio Lamentoso. What does that mean? It means a sad, slow movement. A okay. lamenting movement. And that, that was unusual to put that at the end? It was not only unusual, it was unique. I don't think mm-hmm. it had ever happened before in the history of symphonic music. Wow. So we sit in our seats and we're about to hear the symphony pathétique, as, mm-hmm. it's, as it's now called. It, the word pathétique did not appear in that program, by the mm-hmm. way. It was just symphony number six. And we hear the opening slow introduction. So pathétique was sort of uh, uh, just a name that People gave it later. Tchaikovsky gave it himself. Oh, he did. He it did. It just wasn't in the program. He did. Okay. But he didn't decide upon it until after the premiere. Okay. Okay. Let's hear it. already. It certainly is. Right out of the gate. Yes, so you would have to describe that as gloomy at best. Yeah. I'm, I'm like, I'm on the floor, curled up in a ball right now. You guys can't see it, but it's true. So it starts off morose, yeah. and you heard this four-note theme in the bassoon happening mm-hmm. three times. Yes. La, da, dee, da. Mm-hmm. I like to call that the sighing motive because mm-hmm. the last two, the last two of the four notes, are a downward minor second, the smallest interval that we have. Mm-hmm. 
Tiram. And that downward interval becomes very important throughout the piece. And I'd like to point out how Tchaikovsky, in his later years, was the master of composition and how he took small motives and built a whole symphony around them. Hmm. Now, after that slow introduction, we have the uh, Allegro non troppo, and let's hear what happens to that bassoon theme in the Allegro non troppo. Okay. Yeah, so the four notes are still the same, yeah. but it's faster and it's more staccato, it's more separated. Uh-huh. And as it evolves, it actually becomes almost playful. Almost. Almost. <laughs> but there's still this little hint of, of sadness there. Yeah. Now the audience there would know that Tchaikovsky wrote mammoth first movements in sonata allegro form. Mm-hmm because they would have heard his fourth and fifth symphonies, both of which have really long first movements. And the Sonata Allegro form typically has a first theme group, a second theme group, and then a long section called the development, where those themes are developed, and then finally a return of the first and second themes, and then a coda. So the question is, how does uh, Tchaikovsky organize that in this piece? Well, he starts by anticipating the second theme with this excerpt that you're about to hear. Okay. And you hear the downward scale, first in the double basses and then in the upper winds. Yeah. So that's like that two-note motive that has now become a four-note motive Mm -hmm. going down the scale. Mm -hmm. And as you can see, it still sounds uh, almost happy at this point. Yeah. But then the orchestra really picks up steam and the brass come in mm-hmm. with the same music but in a much different mood. So bombastic. It's, it's it is. And so you. as you can see, the mood has changed dramatically yeah. at least three times so mm-hmm. far. And we're only a couple of minutes uh, into the movement. Then an extraordinary thing happens, which is that this bombastic music settles down and actually comes to a complete halt Mm -hmm. before the second theme. Mm -hmm. And that was unusual, because usually the second theme would uh, appear, you know, it might be contrasted from the first theme, it usually was, but in this case the music stops. And then we have a theme based upon those four notes going down but in a completely different mood. Listen to this second theme, one of Tchaikovsky's most famous. This music is toying with my emotions. It's, it's everywhere. It really is. I have no idea how I'm supposed to be feeling at this point. And here, suddenly, there's something that's quite optimistic because the scale reverses itself and goes up. Yeah. All the melancholy is gone. For the moment. Yeah. In fact, this is the most optimistic moment in the piece, and this theme never comes back in the (laughs) recapitulation. Really? Because by that time, Tchaikovsky is so into the drama of the movement Uh that uh, he decides... Uh, it's not time for optimism as we get toward right. that part of the of the movement. It's it's pretty amazing. Yeah. 
So now we're ready for the development section, okay. where the composer typically takes the themes from the first part, from the exposition, right. and develops them literally. Right. So, so the composer just kind of, kind of uh, puts these themes out there, puts, puts these patterns of notes out there, and then the development is where he takes them and sort of explodes it and, and kind of gives you what, what is to come. And, and boy, did you use the right word, yes. explode. <laughs> this development section really explodes because the softest clarinet has ended the B theme, and now we're ready for the development. Okay. And it sounds like this. Deja, I saw you jump at that chord. <laughs> And audiences do. Wow. Now listen to what happens to the four note theme right here. Now it's in the basses. Back in the violins. And back in the basses here. So Tchaikovsky has taken this four-note theme and now he has made it into one of the most sophisticated uh, musical activities, a fugue, with uh, one voice doing the theme and then another answering it. Uh-huh, uh-huh. In the midst of all this tumult, mm -hmm. the music quiets down and then we hear a tune that the Russian audience would know because it's part of the uh, Orthodox Church Service Requiem. Uh -huh. Here it is in the trombones. And then it goes on from there. What is that doing in the middle of this piece of music? Well, that's part of the unspoken program. Now, for your listeners, we musicians use the term program. Of course, it's the program with the written notes. Mm -hmm. But also, a piece of music can have a program in the sense of having a story. Ah. Like the tone poems of Richard Strauss, where he tells right. the story of Till Eulenspiegel, or he tells the story of Don Juan. Mm -hmm. Now, Tchaikovsky, in his letters, told us, he told his brother and his nephew, that this symphony is the story of his own life, of Tchaikovsky's life. Oh. And Tchaikovsky always felt that he was, in a way, a victim of fate. Mm -hmm. And in this symphony, we've already noticed it's going to end with us an adagio lamentoso. Mm -hmm. So that already forebodes something. Right. But here in the first movement, he's showing you a brief passage from the Russian Orthodox Requiem Mass, which the audience of that day would know because they had been to church on the previous Sunday, and perhaps someone had died recently, mm -hmm. and that music would have been played then. This is sort of foreshadowing in a way. It is. It, it foreshadows what's coming in the music, and it foreshadows what Tchaikovsky was going to later feel in his life, assuming that his the the autobiography of this music is chronological. It's sort of... Yes, yeah. that's exactly okay. right. And now I'd like to uh, play one more excerpt from the first movement, because I mentioned recapitulation, where mm -hmm. the themes come back. Okay. Well, in this case, the recapitulation of the first theme is so covered that you might not even notice. Yeah. It's covered only thematically, but it's actually screamed fortissimo by the entire orchestra, whereas at the beginning, you remember, it was rather soft. Yeah. This is the recapitulation. And you can hear how different it was. Yeah. In fact, I would hazard a guess that that Russian audience didn't recognize it as a recapitulation because it still sounds like development. Would they have felt like, would, would the audience have recognized that that was strange? Because when, when I hear this, I'm hearing a piece of classical music. Yeah. You know, and, and I, anything is, is fair game to, to me as a list, my untrained ears. But for them, would they have been sort of like, my God, what is happening? Probably not. Okay. But I think what they would have noticed is that as this music goes on and eventually quiets down, the second theme 
which is the love theme, mm-hmm. the one that didn't make that made you know made you wonder how to feel, comes back again. Mm-hmm. And they would hear that and say, "Oh, this is the second theme," because that's very very apparent. Okay. And they might say, "Gee, I didn't hear the first theme," you know, because <laughs> it went by, yeah. you know, in that flurry of activity. I see. Oh, wow. Sneaky. And the movie in the the movement, in fact, ends quietly, and it ends in a major key, in an optimistic key. Mm-hmm. And that's how the first movement ends. Okay. So now usually the second movement is the slow movement. Uh And in this case, we've already seen on our program that it's going to be the fourth movement rather than the second movement. Yeah. In this case, the second movement is the dance movement. Mm -hmm. Every symphony has a dance movement, whether it's a minuet or a scherzo. But in this case, it's an unusual waltz because... It's not just in 3-4 time, as a waltz is, but it's in 2 plus 3. So it's like a waltz with a missing beat. Then we go on to the third movement. Okay. The third movement is sort of a combination of a scherzo, which is the usual joke-like movement. Right, and it's it's uh, I've learned this is it's very rapid fire sort of sort of upbeat. It is faster. indeed, yeah. and in this case, the scherzo morphs into a march, into a triumphal march. Uh-huh. So let's hear the beginning of the third movement, the scherzo part. Okay. And the little oboe theme that you hear now is a foreshadowing of the march theme, Uh which comes later. Okay. So is that just acting as a sort of um, transition into the the final movement? No, this this third movement is, is huge. Okay. It really takes the place of the typical symphonic finale. Uh So the scherzo sort of morphs into this march, and the march is triumphant, just like the last movement of Beethoven's Fifth Symphony or Beethoven's Ninth Symphony. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I'd like you to hear that march theme. Here it is. And there you have it. Now, the movement is long. It goes Mm -hmm. on for quite a while. There's another theme that we don't have time to play for you. But I would like you to hear the final appearance of this theme with the full orchestra blasting away at triple forte. Sounds like Star Wars. <laughs> it certainly does. The victory march at the end. It's definitely a victory march. And yeah. of course, the symbol tells you that we've arrived at the victory. Yeah. I just keep thinking, since I know that this is an autobiographical symphony, like w- what periods of Tchaikovsky's life he was, he was depicting. And I'm imagining that that was when he you know, rose to fame and he was, you know, making bank and he was he was doing really well and you're absolutely well right you are absolutely right because by this time in his life Tchaikovsky was wealthy uh-huh. and world famous yeah so this is his triumph as a yeah. as a composer but but we've got the fourth movement the coming. big but Okay. The fourth movement coming. Yeah. Let's just play the first four measures. Okay. And that 
that's the first theme. Notice that it is still downward scales, which lend an, an air of mournfulness to it. Yeah. And then you have yum, babi, that little sighing theme. Yeah. So this music actually relates to the first movement very strongly, the downward scale and then the sighing motive, which happens throughout. Now, uh, because it says lamentoso, you know that this is going to be a lament. Uh, most laments, though, have a moment of redemption in the middle. And this symphony does, uh, in the sense that the second theme of the last movement is also a downward scale, but with a totally different mood. Here's the second theme. And you can see that by itself, this theme is far from tragic. It sounds it's hopeful. Hopeful, yeah. exactly. However, I'm sorry to tell you this movement does not end hopefully mm. because this second theme gets influenced by the first theme. So now let's hear the second theme as it evolves into the kind of tragedy that the first theme portends. And what could be more tragic than that? Whew. It's just like a downward, well, not quite a spiral, but definitely well, a downward movement. I like the of, word spiral. It is a downward spiral. Yeah. And then the movement ends sadly. Mm -hmm. You can hear the heartbeat and the double basses coming up. Notice how we're moving lower and lower in the string section. Mm -hmm. The violins are done, mm -hmm. the violas are done, this is just cellos and basses as the music gets lower and lower. You can still hear the heartbeat in the double bass, but... Heartbeat starts slowing down. I'm devastated. Did, did audiences just sit in their seats going, oh my God, what, what has happened? I mean, he just... Well, I was very, very pleased that our audience for the Houston Youth Symphony performance in November, mm -hmm. sat totally silently for 12 seconds. Yeah. That's a long time. Yeah. And then they erupted in the usual ovation. The audience in Tchaikovsky's day didn't know what to think of this. They had never heard a piece end like this. Mm -hmm. And the reception was actually somewhat lukewarm. Really? Yes. Do you think that it was just because they were accustomed to leaving a symphony on a lighter note. Yes. Uh, you know, having come through, you know, triumph and, and, you know, big finales, and he ends with this. Exactly. 
And both the fourth and fifth symphonies do that. They start in a minor key in the mm-hmm. sad key, mm-hmm. and both of them end triumphantly. Yeah. And I think the audience might have been expecting a triumphant ending until they looked at their program and saw Adagio Limentoso and thought, my goodness, what's going on here? Mm-hmm. And so this is the story of, of Tchaikovsky's life. Okay, so that's the story in music. Let's talk a bit about the story in words. I, I know he had a really complicated life. I don't know a lot about it. I know that he was gay, but um, and that you know that that played into his the, the tragic end of his life. Shostakovich, as a young man was quoted as saying, we like talking about Mussorgsky, but our favorite topic of conversation is Tchaikovsky's love life. <laughs> oh, poor Tchaikovsky. And well, and Tchaikovsky's love life is incredibly well documented uh-huh. because he traveled so widely and he was a prolific letter writer. Yeah. Those letters were pretty much suppressed uh, by the Russian government and uh, by the Soviet Union, but they've come to light in recent years. Mm-hmm. And so we know the extent of, of his love life. Yeah, well, the the Russian government is still pretty uncomfortable with homosexuality, as we've seen in the news. They certainly are. That's an understatement. Recently. So, so, wow. So they, they just suppress the information. So what what has come to light? Well, the official story was that after the premiere, which took place on October 28th, 120 years ago, 2013, I'm, we're, we're recording this in 2013, but in uh, uh, 1893, um, we had the premiere, and then nine days later, Tchaikovsky was dead. Nine days later? Nine days later. Wow. And the official story was that he died of cholera. Uh-huh. There was a cholera epidemic going on in St. Petersburg at the time. Mm -hmm. And it has been discovered since then that sometimes restaurants would put unboiled water in with the officially boiled water in order to cool it off a little bit for their customers. So it's plausible that Tchaikovsky might have drunk some tainted, tainted water and died of cholera. He was known to have stomach ailments all of his life. He had terrible upset stomachs. And in fact, uh, one of the known uh, facts about his uh, end was that he delayed being treated for a couple of days because he thought it was just one of his usual stomach ailments. So then we had the official story from his brother Modeste and his doctors that he died of cholera. But their... um, Stories didn't necessarily jive in terms of the specific day that this happened or the specific symptoms. Mm -hmm. So Tchaikovsky being, you know, the world-famous composer, immediately there were rumors spread about his possibly having committed suicide. This is uh, reminding me of Michael Jackson and all the stories circulating about his death. You know, and someone else just yesterday said, this reminds me of Michael Jackson, and in fact, Tchaikovsky was the Michael Jackson of his day. Mm -hmm. He was the most famous musician alive. Paparazzi following him everywhere. (laughs) And of course, it also harkens back to Mozart's death, where he died very young. And uh, I think it's pretty much confirmed that Mozart died of natural causes, but rumors started circulating that Antonio Salieri had poisoned him. But a fantastic, and I mean that in the real sense of the word, story, uh, came to light in 1966. Mm-hmm. Alexandra Ivanova, a Russian musicologist, was told by more than one source that there had been a court of Tchaikovsky's peers at the law school that he went to when he was a young man, mm-hmm. most of whom were gay, mm-hmm. and that there was going to be a scandal involving the son of a nobleman and that Tchaikovsky, therefore, was sentenced to committing suicide. I don't believe that story. Hmm. It didn't come to light until decades later. Mm -hmm. And in my research of Tchaikovsky, I don't see any reason why he would have had to fear a homosexual scandal, because he was a favorite of the Tsar, Hmm. and the Tsar had many homosexuals in his court. 
But and wasn't he, it that, ba- you know, sort of in that day that, I mean, I mean, gay people have been around since humanity has existed, but it's only recently that it's become okay for people to be out of the closet. It was fine for people to be gay then. You just didn't want the news getting out. Was that the case in Tchaikovsky's situation, the, the people that he circulated with? Tchaikovsky was um, very, uh, what shall I say, he covered up his homosexuality. He mm-hmm. didn't uh, flaunt it at all. Mm-hmm. There were other men of Tchaikovsky's age who were much more openly gay than he was. Okay. Okay, so there were people who were openly gay. There were, gay. and, and, and so, some of them worked for the czar. Some of them were the czar's head honchos. Yeah. And so the czar, even though it was officially frowned upon both by the church and the government, uh, they would just, uh, you know, look the other way. Right. In, in the case of someone who was famous and, uh, and or rich. Mm-hmm. And in Tchaikovsky's case, he was famous. Not only that, but in 1888... The czar awarded him a pension of 3,000 rubles a year. Hmm. He was patronized by the czar. Yeah. So I, fi- I myself personally find it unbelievable that Tchaikovsky would fear some kind of a homosexual scam. Huh. Okay. Well, so what do you think? What do you think the deal was? I think that he probably died of natural causes. Uh-huh. And some musicologists would disagree with me and some would agree with me. If you, I've read <laughs> seven books about the last years of Tchaikovsky and it's about equally divided between those who think he committed suicide and those who think he died of natural causes. But the symphony that we just heard, uh, to borrow your word, sort of portends a suicide. I mean, it's, it, it, it seems to, it's so unusual that it, a symphony, like you said, would end on this down note, this autobiographical symphony. So I can understand why why their rumors are flying about, you know. Oh, I can understand about. why rumors are flying too because of the nature of the piece. Yeah. But composers have written about death before. Mm. This was not new. But this is about himself. This is about Tchaikovsky. Yeah, and it's about him dying. It's not about him committing suicide. Hmm. Committing hmm. suicide is something else. Uh, may I quote to you two of the, of the last letters that he ever wrote? Yeah. Here's the first one. Uh, August 1st, 1893. Yeah. So the, and the premiere was October. So this is pretty, pretty close to it. In my music, I claim utter candor. And although I, too, have a predilection for songs of wistful sadness, yet in recent years at least, I, like yourself, do not suffer from want and can in general consider myself a happy person. Hmm. And then a little later he wrote, this was the month that he died. Mm -hmm. And this is regarding uh, maybe the ambivalence he had toward his homosexuality, which is clear. He did have ambivalence about it. Mm In the Requiem, there is much talk of God the judge, God the punisher, God the avenger. Forgive me, your highness, but I dare to suggest that I do not believe in such a God. Hmm. So he's saying within the month that he died that he believes in a forgiving God, not a punishing God. This is a toughie. It's a toughie. I mean, I, I just, you know, I hear this this symphony and I think, you know, people are very complicated. He they could are. be saying one thing and experiencing another thing entirely emotionally. Yeah, and he, and he wrote similarly tragic music rather early in his life in the, his, possibly his most famous piece, the tone poem Romeo and Juliet, mm-hmm. which ends just as tragically as this. But he's talking about Romeo and Juliet, he is. which ends yep. tragically. Yep, he is. Here he could have written his own ending and if he was so happy, why was there not a happy ending to his story? A happy death, if you will. Well, I don't, thing, I don't right? know. <laughs> I don't know. I can tell you that he finished the symphony in April of 1893. Uh-huh. But he didn't orchestrate it right away. But it was finished. Everything was done. Yeah. Then he wrote a series of 18 piano pieces on commission. 
18 of them. Mm-hmm. I've listened to them. It takes over an hour to play them. These aren't little tiny pieces like the kind that Schumann wrote. These are rather virtuosic piano pieces. Mm. And I would say of the 18, probably mm, 12 of them are happy. And maybe 18 minus 12 is 6 are sad. And he wrote um, some songs, six songs, which are, which are rather sad. Mm-hmm. And then he started on other projects. He was working on projects. Uh, so, so you're saying that this this um, Sixth Symphony Pathétique is is not. It wasn't the last piece that he was working on. It wasn't as if he wrote this and then he was like, "I'm done." Correct. Uh, he, That's he exactly kept right. Going. That's exactly. Most people don't know that okay. because this is the last opus number, yeah. and because it's the last piece oh. of his that was premiered, they think it was the last thing he wrote. But it wasn't the last thing that he wrote. Okay. All right. Classical Classroom listeners, I want to know what you think. Did Tchaikovsky commit suicide or did he not? Michael Webster, thank you so much for coming on to the show. This has been so interesting. What a and, pleasure it has been for me. And thank you so much for bringing in this music by the Houston Youth Symphony. If you had not told me that it was a youth symphony, I never would have guessed that. Listeners, if there's anything that you would like to learn more about on the Classical Classroom, or you'd like to weigh in on Tchaikovsky's death and your theories thereon, send me an email at dclay at classical917.org. If you want to listen to past episodes or find out what's coming up on the Classical Classroom, go to classical917.org backslash classroom. Thanks for listening, and we'll catch you next time.